Well, let's turn to another company where the narrative is not necessarily rising costs, at least not the main one. When we're talking about Johnson & Johnson, sales were up about 8% at the company, pharmaceutical sales up even more. But overshadowing that is what's going on with vaccines at the company. And our Adam Shapiro talked to the CFO of Johnson & Johnson about the company's quarter and about the vaccine situation. Adam, um, you know, this is overshadowing things for a lot of the drug makers right now. They are, but with Johnson & Johnson, when we spoke with Joe Wolk this morning, the CFO, he pointed out that their vaccine is on track and everybody's looking at Friday as a day when the U.S. government is going to make its recommendation whether to proceed or continue to halt the J&J &J vaccine inoculations. Here's what he told us. Yeah, Adam, you know, I think it's really a testament to the strength of Johnson & Johnson's diverse portfolio. Some of this is favorable comps. If you look at our medical device business, we're very pleased with the 9% growth because there's still some elective procedures across the globe that are on pause. But pharmaceuticals continues to lead the way in terms of market performance. Uh, consumer, we did have, a, a, I'd say, a choppy comparison. But recall, first quarter of 2020, we had many consumers loading up for some of the trusted iconic brands like Tylenol, and we had 11% growth. If I go to a more normal first quarter of 2019, we're up about 7.5% from that mark. So we think it's a sign of a healthy business across all three of our segments. Uh, what I'm really pleased about is we will continue uh, to invest disproportionately in innovation. So our R&D is up year on year, $600 million. That really bodes well for the future of Johnson & Johnson. And I would say that as a, as a company, the investment thesis for us, we're stronger as a company today than before we went into the pandemic. I, I want to talk about the turnaround in medical devices and, and what's happening with consumer health. But before I go there, I got to ask you the headlines. I mean, Dr. Fauci said that the vaccine should be back on track by this Friday. Uh, yet we had that, you know, the FDA reporting another person, although extremely rare, these blood clot situations, and they're still studying what possible link there may be. What does the company want consumers to know about the J&J &J vaccine? More than 7 million in the arms of Americans right now. Yeah, so Adam, you know, I think, uh what we do know is that safety is the utmost importance for all of our products, not just for the vaccine, but for every product that we issue in any of our segments. Uh, here, the process worked. We identified a situation that gave us reason for uh, a concern. We brought that to the regulators in the FDA here in the U.S., as well as those in Europe. Uh, we're evaluating the data now. I think we are very much on track to have the, the pause uh, remedied. Uh, over the next coming days, uh, you probably saw in South Africa, that pause was lifted. Again, our vaccine has probably the most robust data package around some of these newer variants. And so we feel very confident and, and are hopeful that the, the benefit risk profile of this product will continue to be a solution to help fight the global pandemic. One follow up on that, because so many of us are counting on a one shot vaccine from J&J &J to get through this pandemic. The emergent plant delay, the federal government pausing operations there. What is that doing to J&J's commitment to fulfill its vaccine obligation to the U.S.? Yeah. So again, here, too, quality is important. Uh, we brought the issue to the FDA. Uh, we are going to remediate what needs to be remediated. Assuming the regulatory process goes well and the regulators get comfortable, we'll be in very good position, not just to meet our commitments uh, contractually here in the U.S., but across the globe. So let's get back to these numbers, though. The medical device unit, I remember you all took a hit during the worst of the pandemic. Obviously, hospitals were shutting down elective surgeries. But now that's turned around. What is the trajectory for medical devices, especially with full-year guidance, um, now anywhere from 87 to 9.9%, .9%, uh, where it had been up from 8, uh, 8 to 9.5%. Uh, How is medical devices going to play a role in that going forward? Yeah, so Adam, you may recall in the beginning of the year, we walked into really an uncertain situation. You had a rising case count here in the U.S. and other parts of the world, uh, uh, and we were just unsure. As the first quarter kind of came to fruition, we saw some of that risk diminish. 
Uh, the medical device team has done an outstanding job in terms of their competitiveness. They've got a better cadence of innovation than they did uh, one or two years ago. So we think we're very well suited for uh, substantial growth. If you think about the second quarter, which we're currently in, last year that, that uh, segment was down about 33%. So we're going to see a favorable comp, but I would actually point your audience more to just the execution uh, and the competitiveness of the unit as well. Our 9% growth, we're, we're very pleased with for the first quarter. But again, recall, there's there's still parts of the, the world that are uh, pausing elective procedures at this point. So we expect a robust performance for the balance of this year, and we're well suited for 2022 and beyond. And the consumer health unit, that was the one place where you were down 2.9%. Is that still pandemic related? Yeah, that's more of a, that's an unfavorable comparator, right? So if you think about last year in the first quarter, uh, there was a high, elevated consumer demand for pantry loading on products like Listerine and, and Tylenol. Um, we grew 11% first quarter of 2020. So we were walking into a, a pretty tough comparison. Uh, if, if you just take a, a, maybe a better barometer and look at the first quarter of 2019, we're up about 7.5% from that mark. And we think that's a good a better apples to apples comparison than maybe 2020 to 2021 for the first quarter. But that um, that unit's doing a nice job in terms of their margin profile and will be competitive and grow in line with the market for those areas in which we compete. Joe, one last question for you. You're the world's third largest pharmaceutical company, largest in the United States, and you're a target at times, but there's that lawsuit in California, the opioid lawsuit. Um, there are four major pharmaceutical companies which are part of that. Any concern that this would have an impact uh, depending on the verdict on the company's growth? Now, Adam, you may recall that we reserved a significant amount last year and the year before for the opioid uh, settlement. We intended that to be a final agreement in principle. We think that will play out. We're working collaboratively with the state attorney generals to see that through. Uh, and so that's where we would stand with that. Uh, we're not, uh, a, not envisioning more risk or less risk at this point in time. Anything you want to add before we wrap up? No, again, just I think it, the dividend of declaration of 5% approved by the board, it just underscores uh, for the 59th year in a row of increases, uh, just the conviction that we have as a management team that the board has in terms of the prospects. We're performing today and meeting the expectations or exceeding the expectations, but I, I'm actually very proud that we're well suited for uh, growth in 2022 and beyond. And Julie, they like to point out that the board raised the dividend 5%. They've raised the dividend now uh, every time, something going back almost 60 years. Julie? Yeah, and I'm looking at that dividend yield at about 2.5%. So if you're looking at fixed income or you're looking at J&J, &J, you're getting a higher yield, uh, definitely, but and then some from J&J &J at this point. Adam, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Interesting story there with J&J.